variation in the physical environment has led to a wide array of biological communities. This is because the Earth's surface isn't uniform. The physical environment varies, and light, temperature, moisture, and other factors vary as well, determining the distribution and adaptation of organisms. So we'll get familiar with some of the distinctive climatic zones in this lecture and talking about biomes. Within each zone, topography, that is, features of geology, elevation, and soil types further cause differentiation of the environment and the species that can live there. So variation in climate can be both spatial, depending where you are on the surface of the earth, and temporal, changing over the seasons of the year or maybe even over the course of a day. And then within that spatial variation, we have predictable and unpredictable variation. Because of the way the Earth is positioned and turns, that distribution of solar energy makes the seasons change. And then the surface of the Earth sticks up or is concave in different places, further altering um, the range in, in temperature and precipitation. And then there are random stochastic disturbances that provide unpredictable variations. This picture is so pretty. It's of a mountain stream in the springtime of Sierra Nevada fed by snow melt higher up. So this is one kind of predictable seasonal variation. Diurnal variation could just be the drastic differences in temperature between night and day, especially pronounced in dry climates. And then unpredictable things are like hurricanes and cyclones, El Nino events, or even on a small scale, just variable weather patterns. You know how sometimes here in Miami, you may have a lot of rain at your house and a couple blocks away, your friend doesn't have any. I think of the Earth sometimes as a giant heat transforming machine because it's solar powered and solar energy hits the surface of the earth differently in different places and it's absorbed differently as well and redistributed by winds and currents of the ocean so these things all cause latitudinal variation and the circulation patterns of the winds and the oceans in general as you go towards the poles from the equator, both temperature and rainfall decrease. At the higher latitudes toward the poles, the solar beam is spread over a greater area, so the solar energy in any given spot is less intense. Because it travels a longer path, it's weakened. Additionally, um, land masses experience greater differences in temperature over the year or day and night than bodies of water because water has a tempering effect. We can see this even within our state of Florida. Places along the coast stay warmer than inland areas in very cool times of the year and they stay cooler in the hottest times of the year. I like this figure because it shows how at different latitudes the amount of variation is much greater in the northern hemisphere than the southern hemisphere and one reason for this is there's a lot more land mass in the northern hemisphere. So air circulation is influenced by solar energy and toward the equator the air is heated and rises until it reaches a point and cools and falls to the earth, causing precipitation. And these two Hadley cells, or tubular uh, bands of 
rising air and falling air around the equator propel temperate Hadley cells that go down and up, and then there are polar cells as well. And then as the, if you look at the figure at the left, you see these bands between 0 and 30 degrees, 30 and 60 degrees. And as the Earth turns, this causes um, air to s turn clockwise and counterclockwise. So the principal patterns of atmospheric circulation come from these Hadley cells. So from the equator, warm, moist air rises in the tropical regions, spreading to both the north and south. And then at about 30 degrees north and south, the air cools and sinks returning to the tropics at the surface, causing this tubular band of air circulating. This drives the secondary temperate cells between 30 and 60 degrees north and south of the equator, and in turn they drive the polar cells. What results is that areas at higher latitudes are much drier than areas toward the equator. You can see that the rainforests, especially the tropical rainforests that are in the tropics, there is some temperate rainforest in the northwestern part of North America and also a little bit in Scotland. But So I want you to think about the benefits and costs or pros and cons of living in a humid climate here in Miami. We sure, sure do. And think about if you might prefer living in a dry climate or what some of those drawbacks might be. As I said, the earth turns and so the flow of air is deflected to the left in the southern hemisphere and to the right in the northern hemisphere. So the air flows toward the, the west in the tropics, toward the east in the temperate zone, and again toward the west toward the poles. So this figure shows these patterns and we even give these trade winds their names from the temperate to the tropics and the westerlies more toward the poles. An interesting phenomenon is that of rain shadows. I guess it's called a shadow because like a shadow of light is where there's no light, it's dark. And so a rain shadow has no moisture. What happens is as moist air masses come over a mountain, the air cools and loses its capacity to hold water. So rain falls, making that side moist. But then as the air comes over the mountain and warms as it descends, it absorbs, takes up all the moisture of the land. And so this causes desert conditions on the lee side of mountains away from bodies of water. One place you can see this is in the Sierra Nevada with the Pacific Ocean to the left, the foothills coming out of the Central Valley where there's a lot of agriculture receive a lot of rain and so the, the west side of the mountains is green, the side toward the ocean. As the air travels over the, the crest and warms, it pulls the moisture up and we get very dry conditions in the, the Great Basin. So ocean currents are also affected by the surface of the earth under the ocean. It's not only the winds, but the basins that constrain flow and also temperature and salinity influences currents still deeper, but basically currents circulate clockwise in the northern hemisphere and counterclockwise in the southern hemisphere as warm tropical waters in both hemispheres carry the heat toward the poles. So this map shows clockwise circulation of currents north of the equator and counterclockwise south of the equator. So 
So since the Earth is tilted, the seasonal progression of the sun's edge of hitting the Earth, the zenith, causes familiar temperature patterns. Toward the tropics, between the tropics, there is a region of high precipitation shifting north or south, and regions of arid conditions also shift. And what this gives you is two rainy seasons and two dry seasons in the most tropical of areas. So Bogota, close to the equator, has two rainy seasons in spring and fall, separated by drier periods. In South America, Rio de Janeiro, at 20 degrees south, has a rainy season in the winter, and dry season in the summer. Merida, in the Yucatan Peninsula of Mexico, north of the equator, has a rainy season in the summer and a long dry season in what we consider the winter months. Every 10 or 12 years there are extreme fluctuations and changes in currents that cause cascading ecological effects. This is caused by the reversal of high and low pressure areas in the central Pacific Ocean that is called the Southern Oscillation. So we call these events El Nino and ENSO is El Nino Southern Oscillation. So severe events as I mentioned occur irregularly but about once every decade or a little more. When these ENSOs happen there's drought in places not used to being without rain in South America, Africa, and Australia. And outside of the tropics, where it's usually drier, there's more precipitation. And what happens is fishery, the available fish change because the cold, deep water upwelling patterns don't usually uh, are reversed. And the seabirds that count on those fish are diminished too. So there are lots of cascading effects both in aquatic and terrestrial systems. This figure shows what happens during the El Nino time of the year where there's more moisture than normal in places normally dry and drier conditions in places normally wet. The La Nina is sort of the return to normal but even more so. So wet places are wetter than usual, dry places drier than usual. And the ENSO index can be plotted and you can see supraannual variation, how over the years these things fluctuate. So locally, topography can af affect the climate too. In mountain areas, steep slopes often lead to dry conditions because water comes down those steep slopes, especially if there's a rain shadow but the bottoms of mountains tend to be moist and often have rivers and riparian forests even in places very dry. In the northern hemisphere if a mountain slope faces the south the conditions are warmer than on the side of the mountain that faces north and people who study flowering plants often see a much longer flowering period with flowers opening much earlier and the plants have longer to develop. So as you go up in mountains, the temperature decreases, and this is because of adiabatic cooling. With air expanding, less pressure, performing work, and therefore cooling. And as I mentioned before, cooler air can't hold as much moisture, so we get precipitation. And then over the crest of a mountain, that air rewarms making the lee side of the mountain warmer and drier than the side close to the water. It's this adiabatic cooling that makes it seem like you've gone to the temperate zone when you go up mountains in tropical areas. In fact, there's a temperature decrease of 6 to 10 degrees centigrade for every thousand meters you increase in elevation. And typically the higher in elevation, the moister and wetter it is. So mountains in the tropics are higher 
it seems. The snow line is reached at 5,000 meters instead of lower in temperate zones. And as you go up in altitude, a 1,000 meters great increase in altitude corresponds to about an 800 kilometer difference in latitude. So vegetation that you would find in a cold place in the temperate zone not necessarily on a mountain, but maybe in a mountain, a lower mountain, you would find in a higher mountain in the tropics. And let's not neglect the seasons of a lake that in temperate zones may freeze over in winter at the top of the lake and the coolest temperatures are right at the surface. Water staying deeper in the lake is not necessarily frozen. In the spring the sun warms the surface and the denser water sinks because as you, you know ice is less dense than liquid water and there's spring overturn where nutrients cycle up from the bottom. In the summer with the heat beating down, the top of the lake is much warmer than the bottom, thermal stratification. And then in the fall, the cool area, uh, cooled by the cold breezes going by, will sink again, making a nutrient overturn. In a lake, we can re refer to the epilimnion, the s surface water, and the hypolimnion, the cool, denser, lower water. And a thermocline simply means a zone of rapid temperature change.